All right, uh, questions? Yvonne, yeah. Uh, I have a question for you, Jeff. You mentioned at the beginning that one of the interesting questions you can probe is whether or not splicing is really essential. And I was wondering if it's if it's not possible for alternative splicing to still occur even though you don't have introns anymore. Because of, some of these silencer sites, etc., are actually the exons, right? So, um, in yeast, we have only 5% of genes have introns. And the vast, vast, vast majority of those have one intro. Mm -hmm. So there essentially is no uh, alternative splicing in cerevisiae. There, there are a couple of genes that have more than one introns, and one of those shows alternative polyadenylation, but that's something we could easily refactor. So I would never recommend trying this with your favorite mammalian or plant genome. Any questions? So Jeff, I'll, I'll go ahead while we're waiting. Uh, so if I understand you right, for your redesign, you were able to do, like there wasn't really any part except for the one exception that you said that you weren't able to redesign. And even when you were assembling all these, you never had a problem. I mean, or oh, yeah, am I overstating? <laughs> uh, I guess I, I'm curious, yeah, like we, what was the biggest thing that you couldn't redesign that you were surprised by maybe besides the example you gave? <laughs> actually, so yeah, I, I, I usually spend a lot of time on this at the beginning when I talk and I, I didn't okay. do it today. But we spent almost nine months thinking about what would be the smart things to change and what was too risky to, okay. to go for. So in fact, so far, nothing has crashed due to the fundamentals of the design. Okay. Um, one change of plans that we made after chromosome 3, chromosomes 6, and chromosome 8 were already designed and underway was this paper came out from a group that had first said you can delete introns with impunity um, from many genes, which is a true statement. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some exceptions to it, so we leave, leave them in for now. The, there came a second paper, that, and, and we didn't know yet whether SIN3 was going to work. Mm -hmm. The second paper comes out and says, Actually, if you delete ribosomal protein introns, and there's quite a few of those, mm -hmm. there's often a fitness defect associated with it. So we actually pivoted and said, okay, from this point on, we're going to leave the ribosomal proteins in, the introns in, and then come back and take them out later, you know, very carefully. Because it turns out you can get around these fitness defects by fiddling with gene expression levels. So that, I'd, I'd say that, that one is um, probably the one that, it's the one place where we actually made a change on the fly. Yeah. But everything else, we haven't changed the original design, so it's very consistent from chromosome to chromosome. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, almost a social engineering question. You were able to get all these different groups and countries to all agree on the same design, so is it a uniform design across all of the chromosomes? Yeah, that was a mandatory uh, aspect of the project. Uh, so you had to get your own funding, that was, that was one. Uh, mm -hmm. Second one was um, we had to do the design, so that enforced you know design um, uniformity. Okay. And the third one was you had to agree to give away all the strains and all the DNA sequences without restriction, basically to any you know academic or industrial uh, partner. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the three major things, and and some there, we got some pushback on some of those, but uh, we, we didn't basically didn't budge on those three principles. Other questions? Yeah? So you can tinker quite a lot with, uh, with this, this individual, basically, but I'm wondering what happens if you put this strain into competition with the natural strains. Right. So, um, very good point. So, there's fitness and there's fitness, right? <laughs> Uh, so, we have a very nice way to do co-cultures and you know, measure the fluorescence with the RFP in one and GFP in the other. And so we have that assay up and running and we've so far applied it to chromosome SYN10 and seen no defect uh, after many uh, <coughs> cycles of co-culture. Now that's under one condition, of course. And I'm I'm sure we will find we will find conditions where it's 
not going to be as fit as wild type. But we have also seen some instances of apparent gain of function uh, after scrambling. So if we, one way perhaps to get around fitness defects would be to do some light scrambling and select for things that can cover fitness. That was one of the things that we worried about and prompted us to include the scrambling in the well, What about sex with your sympathetic theory? No problem. It's sexy as hell. <laughs> they, uh, so far, and they've never been selected for meiosis, right? But when we put them through meiosis, so far, all of them have been uh, proficient at it. Maybe it's a mate with the mitral with the wild type? Uh, both. Both to themselves and to the wild type. Yeah. I'm not sure we've done that with all of the synthetic chromosomes we've completed yet, but definitely for chromosome 9R, 3, <coughs> and 6, uh, we've done that experiment. If I were to look for an explanation why you only find one, one type in your population, it would be somewhere there. In the that you need to conform to the, to the natural configuration. So you, you can, for a functional point of view, you can scramble as you wish, but if you want to mate with other types, you need... To... Oh, I'm not talking about the scrambled strains. I'm just talking about the, the base strains. Yeah. Okay, remember, the scrambling is something you do after you finish the synthesis. So after scrambling, there will definitely be strains that have mating and, and meiosis defects. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> so yeah, um, so you should when you induce a scrambling probably you get a lot of cells that die, right? Yes. And you would expect that this effect would be even more pronounced when you start combining all the different uh, synthetic chromosomes because you have mm -hmm. even more possibilities to okay. mess up with the cell. Is that something you're worried about? Uh, at some point, will even a short induction just kill everything? Well, we have two knobs we can turn. One is the short, the, the time, and the other is the concentration of the ligand, uh, you know, the, uh, the compound that activates the creep. So, we, in fact, what we do now for our evolution experiments, we're evolving these strains, is we actually run them without the estradiol, and there's a tiny bit of uh, background scrambling, and a little bit of leakiness, and um, and then there's a, another knob we can turn is the promoter that's driving the creek. So uh, we're pretty confident that we'll be able to handle that one. But it, it's definitely a, a valid concern. That's not a question for Jeff. So uh, as I understand it, BioStudio is a software to design uh, genomes, uh, both in an automated and in a manual way. And my question is whether it has been, I mean, the design software has been designed in order to used beyond the USCP project. Is it uh, flexible enough? It is. In fact, uh, Tom has been very frustrated because we haven't, he hasn't been able to get it to run on his computer. But I'm happy to tell you, Tom, that we now have an AWS instance that I think can be uh, working anywhere. So we're happy to send it to anyone. It is completely generic. It's based on gbrowse, which is the generic browser, or you can do jbrowse, but we mostly use gbrowse. Uh, so it it's, should be quite generic. And we've even done circular bacterial genomes on there just as a demonstration. Oh, uh, there's a question here, maybe. Oh, actually, sorry, I forgot. Uh, there's been a request to have the question repeated, so oh, um, uh, I, I apologize. So from now on, maybe we can repeat the question before you answer it. Thanks. All right. So, so Jeff, you had mentioned 21 um, fitness uh, conditions, but I was wondering for maybe genome or chromosome three, um, if you look at kind of transcriptional profile, like essentially profiling um, any kind of epigenetic profiling. Things like that. Do you see? It, you know, maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm just curious whether you see signatures that the yep. places you change there are changes or right. Yeah. So um, uh, Ming is asking, um, did we do transcriptional profiling or other types of profiling? And uh, of course we did. And, uh, <laughs> the vast majority of cases there's essentially no change, no statistically significant change to um, the expression, you know, other than, you know, subtelomeric genes, quote unquote, that we deleted, which are no longer there, so they come way up on the volcano plot. Um, I was telling you earlier, we, we have done more limited proteomics on some of these strains, uh, and, uh, 
again, occasionally, like the, the one I showed pre-4, um, we turn something up, but it's probably, you know, on the less than 1% of the time level. Yes? I had a question about the bacterial CRISPR. Um, mm -hmm. So you deliver these systems using bacterial phages, right? So have you observed any resistance coming up um, against, not against the CRISPR, but against the bacterial phage delivery itself? Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you would definitely expect to see different kind of resistance to this strategy. So you could uh, definitely resist to the CRISPR by introducing mutation in the target and also block the entry of the CRISPR uh, by uh, just mutating the, the receptors of the, of the phage capsids. Um, uh, we haven't observed that so far and the reason is, is quite simple is uh, to these events you expect them to, to happen but at a relatively low frequency. And in our case we see survivors at a much higher frequency than the, the, the frequency of mutation and the survivors we observe are just cells that did not receive the CRISPR at all. And that's just because if you, even if you uh, deliver uh, hundred times more phage meat particles than cells, you will always have uh, uh, bacteria that just don't receive it. And we also observe that there is actually some, uh, some variability. Doesn't, you would expect it to follow some sort of, uh, of Poisson distribution, but it actually does not. And it indicates that probably some cells tend to have more receptors than other cells in the population. So there might be some variability that also explains why some don't receive it. <clears throat> Coming back to the uh, yeast artificial chromosomes or synthetic chromosomes, I actually have three questions. So first, the, the neo chromosomes, are they real chromosomes like linear chromosomes with telomeres and uh, Rs and centromeres and things? Uh, yeah. Why don't yes. you do them one at a time? Can yeah. you repeat the so question? And then? Do, do neo chromosomes have Rs, centromeres and telomeres? <laughs> and the answer is they uh, always have Rs and centromeres. Uh, and we can make them either in a circular format, in which case they don't need telomeres, or uh, we can make them linear. Uh, we described a little tool we call the telomerator, which is a little device you can insert into any circular chromosome, and then when you cut, it uh, reveals two seed sequences, and it very efficiently establishes a linear chromosome. Okay, and then the, the second question was uh, on the... Uh, ribosomal DNA uh, uh, regions, uh, you said that uh, they insulate the uh, chromosome regions and I wonder if you could, could tell us why that could be or how that could be. Uh, oh mechanistic. right, yeah, so how the question is how does the ribosomal DNA kind of insulate two domains of the chromosome and I think <clears throat> the nucleolus is a gigantic structure, right, and so at, at one end, if you will, the DNA is coming in from the centromere, and at the other end it's going out to the telomere, and those two sites are not close to each other at all. They're very far apart, in fact. So, as a result, uh, those chains are really separated from each other by, uh, I think the nucle nucleolus is estimated to be about close to a third of the nuclear volume, and so I think that's that's what makes it essentially behave like two separate chromosomes from that perspective. And re related to that, you showed that on other chromosomes you would have potential insertion sites uh, for the ribosomal DNA of RON, and what is a potential insertion site? Any phosphodiester bond you want that doesn't disrupt the essential gene. So it could in be theory. A, it in theory. Okay, it was not, nothing special uh, no. about the two sites? Okay. No, nothing special. Yeah. I had a question as well about the scrambled <coughs> genomes. Um, so you see these copy number alterations. Right? And so am I right seeing that most of those are like direct repeats um, in the genome? And then my question would obviously be how about the stability of these things once you've selected them, just propagated them afterwards? Okay, so the first question is are the repeats uh, tandem repeats? Uh, and the answer is they don't have to be. In fact, many of them are inverted or partially inverted, which is a signature 
of something called uh, rolling circle double rolling circle amplification, which had been described for the two micron circle. Yeah. Um, and we also see what we call transpositions, where a copy just jumps in between uh, in, in, into another Vox P site on the same chromosome. I see. Um, and your second question was? Stability of uh, stability. such strength. So uh, well, we haven't really studied that at stability of the scrambled strains very extensively, but what I can say is that it's stable enough that <coughs> we can determine an unambiguous <coughs> genome sequence from short read sequencing. Okay. But that's about all I can say. So they've had like 30 generations. Yeah. 30 doubling. Yeah, but of course that doesn't mean that somewhere in there you didn't have a small clone that sure. underwent yeah. something. And we do know that if you pick the little <coughs> colonies, mm -hmm. they are often very phenotypically unstable. So there may be some ongoing instability there, perhaps from dicentrics or something like that. So we have decided to leave those alone. Yes. I did not understand what you said about modeling human disease and pathway transplant. Uh, the yeast is fine, uh, and the attribution of patient disease disorder was erroneous. What I didn't get there. Right, so uh, the question is, uh, just to clarify what I said about patient mutations. So, there are many, many case reports in the medical literature correlating a neurological or other disorder with the existence of a patient mutation in some gene, right? Because the person found this mutation and they think um, it might be associated with the disease, but they are very descriptive. And so we've actually, we're two for two on this. There were two reports of mutations in this pathway. What disease were they? They were rare, you know, very rare, complex neurological syndromes in one case, and I can't remember the detail of the other one, but it's not, you know, something that's arisen twice <coughs> or once. And, and the data, you know, were limited. And uh, what we did was we moved that exact mutation into the yeast, and it's still, we cannot distinguish a change in the phenotype. Okay, but that is one uh, explanation. Uh, don't you think, because this happened several times, especially, I don't remember the details, but in, in mouse, mm -hmm. and it turned out that the um, physiology, that the pathway of the mouse is different, so you cannot uh, prove the, phen the phenomenon, the, the mutation, or the defect, because you, you, your choice, the choice of your organism is wrong. And then, uh, I think the way to, to, to cure this is to humanize the, the, the whole pathway, or, and then you find what you well, so. Right, so I totally agree with you, first of all. Uh, but we did humanize this entire pathway. We, we humanized, we did every step from, you know, starting materials to AMP. Every step is catalyzed, catalyzed by a human enzyme. That being said, it doesn't mean that, for example, the protein doesn't fold exactly the same way or something like that. So it's, it's not, not by any means definitive. But it was surprising to me that zero out of two cases did we recapitulate any defect. Question here? So I have a question for Jeff, and uh, I apologize if I miss it or I'm misunderstanding something in general, <laughs> but um, I was reading about aging and it says maybe it's connecting to instability, so did you look at maybe how uh, your yeast strain could live longer or that how that's mm -hmm. going to impact it and quantitatively? Or like Oh, it's yeah, the question is whether we've looked at the aging phenotypes of any of these strains, and the answer is we haven't. But it's a great idea. Yes. Could you please make a comment on the on the choice of the recipient strain you use to to, to make this synthetic chromosomes? <coughs> Did you, you like to answer that? Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So the question is, what is the strain we chose? And the answer is uh, 
BY 4741, which uh, is a special favorite of mine because we constructed it in our lab. But it, it's also isogenic with the strain that was sequenced. And so our whole, you know, we're building on the shoulders of giants, okay? All the sequencing that was done was done on strains very closely related to this one. And we didn't want to take a chance on, you know, drifting to another sequence and running into problems related to genetic background. So that, that's really the, the main reason. It's, it's a totally horrible strain for doing anything practical, you know, in industry or anything like that. Mm. And so you described the, the lack of chromosome rearrangements in natural uh, isolates of, of yeast. And how, how does that get together with the uh, observation that uh, tRNA genes and transposons are high, high uh, recombination? Uh, right. So why did you take them out if you don't have recombination? Okay, so right. I can see why you're asking the question. So why uh, did I say on the one hand that tRNA genes are hot spots for genome instability, but there are hardly any natural uh, translocations. And the answer is that there are many um, studies where people have done evolution in vitro, in chemostats and turbidostats and things like that. And when you do that, you often have translocations or duplications and a vast percentage of those are due to uh, change, you know, they occur at tRNA genes. So that's where the, where the data comes from. The natural ones also, uh, some, some percentage of them also occur at tRNA genes. Yes. Oh, sorry, Tom. Uh, I've got a question. <laughs> Professor, for you actually, so if you, you, you constructed this flip-flop, uh, this genetic flip-flop system in your, mm -hmm. and you, you remarked that it gave rise to a kind of, a, sort of an, an epigenetic uh, mechanism for it. Um, right. Uh, when you look at sort of the, the, the interaction networks that have been observed so far, do you see similar things? Does it, uh, similar flip-flop type of... Uh, so, um, the question is, uh, the flip-flop toggle switch style network, which we used in, in yeast and has been used by others in bacterial systems. Do you see those in natural networks? Yeah. Uh, yes, they are seen. I, I don't think they're seen in particularly large numbers exactly in that orientation where it's two things repressing one another, other than maybe in the lambda phage switch is, is a common, well-known example, if I remember reading. There's the, one case in yeast, actually. There's one case yeah. in yeast? Uh, yeah, pseudo hypo uh, Pseudo hyphal switch. Okay. Not the, the major gene, but the one the two ones before. Is it a bistable repression? Mm -hmm. I think like Mac Oklahoma's Mac Mono, but he never spoke. Okay. Yeah. Okay, my question. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so both of you uh, talked about gene essentiality and deleting genes. So you could do that with CRISPR into a screen and scramble can do it, we can get down to minimal genomes. Uh, and previous, previously with yeast, people have done knocking every single gene out and now knocking pairs of genes out to look at essentiality as well. Um, but I think I read recently that there's a sort of, it's not a black and white system that someone showed, I think it was in yeast, that you can knock genes out and then depending on how long afterwards you assay whether the cells, how the cells are getting on, they can kind of recover. So a gene that should have led to an essentiality if you let the cells have some time and then the cell can survive without that gene as long as it's got a period to adapt. Uh, so the, the only thing I can say regarding the, I think CRISPR screens for sure are not going to be very well adapted to, to see this kind of, uh, of, uh, of phenotype because you do, you do things in a, in a pool, you only have a certain uh, uh, <coughs> dynamic range of depletion you can observe and uh, if something is, de is, is depleted too strongly at some point it just disappears on the library and you, you, you cannot see if it recovers later so uh, yeah I think probably uh, for this kind of thing you will still have to go manually or maybe with some high throughputs like Jeff is doing but yeah I, I, uh, I heard a, a talk on this at the UC this summer it was quite interesting I think I think the scrambling system could be a, a good way to um, accelerate the discovery of genes that allow bypass of 
that special class of essential genes that's only essential in the absence of some other genomic change. Uh, so I, I'm actually very interested in, in that topic. I think a related question that's much harder to answer is how many different ways do cells die? <laughs> Him. Can I follow that up? Because it seems to me that the dynamic aspect of networks, which you know, is kind of what Tom's talking about with either metabolic networks, which, which can dynamically adjust to different conditions after perturbation and find different you know, stable <coughs> states, is a characteristic, and we heard talks about that earlier in mm -hmm. mammalian cells. And there's also the issue of, of chromatin-based uh, an auto-assembly or auto-regulation for epigenetic control as well, which is clearly you know, these scrambling experiments express, sort of suggest this is what's, something like that is going on in, in the, the yeast um, um, genome. Now, have you got any plans to implement um, probes for that kind of behavior? I'm thinking, for example, uh, DCAS9 type print, uh, approaches to recruit chromatin modifications or something like that where we can create specific uh, modifications and then potentially follow changes that they might propagate. Um, I have a hard time repeating that question, but it, I think uh, part of your question, which, which was also asked before that I didn't really address, was um, do, do we need to worry about are we recapitulating the epigenetic states that would be found in the native genome, right? Well, it's more the mechanisms involved and how you get at get those mm -hmm. in a more direct way. Right. Um, so I, I mean, I think the general question is really important, especially as we look towards modifying more complex genomes, where we have DNA methylation and histone methylation uh, complexity that we don't have in yeast. In the yeast, we're very fortunate in a way that it's a very stripped down system, and um, telomeric silencing and uh, HM locus silencing are very well known to recapitulate from naked DNA within the time it takes a colony to grow. But um, obviously there's a lot more to be learned on that, so we are very interested in introducing other forms of epigenetic regulation from mammals, for example, into yeast. But yeah, the CRISPR would be an interesting, interesting way to go. We haven't thought about that. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I'd be, you know, we thought about that when we started first working with tau effectors. So maybe, you know, and other people have now gone on and shown both with tau effectors and DCAS9, the recruitment of silencing and these kind of things. And that could be part of creating, you know, synthetic subtelomeric regions with metabolic pathways that we can control the silencing of, would be to have the more coordinate regulation in that region of, of silencing and activation. I had a question about that. The tau effector stuff you talked about, it looked like it operated over a range of tenfold, like there was a high background. Yeah. So is there, is that a real background or uh, it, it, how are you going to deal with that? So that's, that's a real background, but part of it is, so we have improved on it in uh, the latest version, I think it's more like 50 fold, but it generally comes from the fact that we're intentionally, this promoter system we're using is a weak promoter, because when we overexpress tau effectors, because we want to use this system to chain tau effectors in logic systems together, when we overexpress tau effectors, we get a lot of stress on the cells. So we're trying to work with kind of a, a weaker system, uh, and this um, Modified PFY1 promoter is, is uh, a lot less than something like GAL, which has a great on-off. Can, can you take... Sorry. Oh, sorry, there was, there's been a couple of people waiting, Jim. Apologies. <laughs> Here. Uh, in the yeast genome, there are many genes that are convergent, overlapping. Did you maintain the overlap, or did you separate the, the open reading frames? Or? So the question is, how do we handle overlapping genes? And... Um, it turns out when you look hard, the vast majority of overlapping genes involve a so-called verified open reading frame with a so-called dubious open reading frame. And uh, so, for example, we had many instances where there was a TAG codon that we had to recode. So we applied the rule 
always change the dubious orf in those, in those instances. Once you go beyond those instances, there are very, very few bona fide overlapping genes. There's, there was one that was really clear cut with two verified ORPs overlapping, and we had a TAG, and you couldn't change it without changing the amino acid. So what we did was we went to nature, and we looked at whether there was anything in nature that had a TAG to TAA mutation, and sure enough, there was one, so we just made that change. <laughs> Me? Yeah. So, um, getting, Jeff, I had a question getting back to the humanized uh, um, metabolic pathway. I was thinking back to uh, Sven Ponka's talk where he was talking about trying to reconstitute 10 enzymes and kind of having to minimize it to the point where it was all in vitro. So, I was thinking in your case for the humanized system, was it just coding regions? Or, you know, you know in the future, if if you were trying to reconstitute it, you know, do you think you'd have to re tweak you know, promoters and things to get levels and so on? Right, so the question is, when we did the pathway transplant, how did we do it? And we'll, uh, that's a slide I took out. So we took the human ORF, we codon optimized it for yeast, and then we assigned to the human ORF the corresponding yeast promoter and terminator. So the regulatory sequences are yeast, the coding sequences are human. And of course, I mean, that's, that's a limitation, and you might want to play with that in the future, but unfortunately, human promoters generally don't just work in yeast. So that would take a lot of fit, pretty Jim, do you still have a question? Yeah, it's, uh, the question is whether can you, can you maintain two chromosomes, identical chromosomes, that might be in different states? So, you know, clearly you've got lock sites tagging each gene to the idea that you might override local control by you know, a D Cas9 with a repressor domain targeted to each gene on a whole chromosome. So you could have active chromosome, silent chromosome, and flip back and forth between each one by induction, which is, gets back to this idea of making substantial perturbations which you then follow the consequences of that, that perturbation. That's a really cool idea. So you're saying target the LOX P sites with the DCAS9 and then make essentially a disome where you have one native chromosome and one site. Yeah, because you have ROM sites as well, so you could have chromosome 3 A and B, for example. Have to check and see if there's any PAM sites in the LOX P site. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, have you made diploids of, of your strains? And do you see any like combination? <laughs> There's, they do recombine meiotically, yeah. um, and um, actually that's, that's the problem with trying to combine multiple synthetic chromosomes, you get all these patchworks out. Mm -hmm. But we've come up with a way to homozygose the synthetic chromosome so that it becomes a non-problem. But they definitely recombine. Mm -hmm. we're, we're working on building recombination maps to see whether the frequencies of recombination along the chromosome are similar to or different from the native. Another question. Um, I remember uh, I, I heard sort of scuttlebutt on that the Blattner strain where he removed all the transposons. As soon as you introduced any foreign DNA, you're basically sort of start contaminating the genome back again with transposons. Have you, do you, a, does the same thing happen in yeast? Uh, and B, have you seen it? <laughs> okay. I. I don't know about the scuttle, but I hadn't heard of that. But um, in our so the question is, uh, will when you bring the transposon back in, will it will it invade? Yeah, so or are transposons hopping from your native yeast chromosomes into your synthetic? Uh, okay, so to that point, do the transposons jump from the native to the synthetic? That was one of the other reasons we made the party chromosome because. As we build the individual chromosomes, we take out the tRNA gene so all the targets are gone. Because those transposons love to go near tRNA genes. Okay. So that keeps them clean. But they don't go elsewhere? We, but, well, the, they will go into the other native chromosomes. But they, they won't go and elsewhere on the synthetic. So they always no. go to the tRNA side. Well, never say always. Yeah, well, yeah. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, thing, the worrisome part is what's going to happen when we you know, start reducing the number of native chromosomes because these transposons have copy number control systems. 
and they're going to start getting like really antsy and jumping like crazy. So, but we we have a plan to outwit them, which is we we know all about the transcription factors they love, and we're going to destroy one of those to you know incapacitate them when we get to that phase. That's the plan. Okay. Uh, any last questions? We're almost out of time. Okay, perfect then. Thanks very much to all of our speakers.